My father is a criminal defense attorney. Was it when he was alive, he was a defense attorney. I remember the first time he told me he was defending someone who had committed murder. I remember thinking like, huh, that's weird that, you know, my dad's a villain, I guess. I remember him sort of responding that it's not that simple. Hi, I'm Nana Kwame J. Brunia, and I'm the author of Chain Gang All-Stars. So Chain Gang All-Stars is about an imagined future in which convicted wards of state can opt out of a sentence of at least 25 years and participate in death matches. There's a whole bunch of other sort of futuristic technology that facilitates these games. So I originally thought Chain Gang was going to be a, a short story in my first book. I had the idea of a woman in a stadium thinking back about this really horrific path she'd had to traverse. As I tried to write that story, it just sort of slowly, but maybe pretty quickly actually, became clear that I wouldn't, I couldn't get my teeth into the subject or the idea the way I wanted to. And I think all short stories, you're kind of getting the tip of the iceberg. But in the case of Loretta Thurwar, who's this protagonist of Chain Gang All-Stars, I felt like I was getting the tip of the tip of the tip and it just wasn't enough. Speculative fiction, which is a term that I more discovered after it was assigned to me. I feel like the first time I saw it was in a review and I was like, how dare you? And then I looked it up, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, that's kind of right, that's me. It's fiction that sort of employs uh, the idea of an imagined future. It is, it's, it's fiction that is willing to depart from maybe a strict reality and usually in service of an idea about our current society. I like speculative fiction because I can be very specific and it's also difficult to reduce. And so I can create conceits or ideas that allow me to be hyper focused on a subject like in the case of Chain Gang All-Stars, the carceral system in prisons. But had I decided to talk about, let's call, call it Louisiana State Penitentiary, for example, it'd be, there'd be examples that are of issues that are within the carceral system that don't apply to that specific place. So by having a spe speculative kind of conceit like the sport Chain Gang All-Stars, I get to really pick and choose what aspects of this broader topic I want to talk about, while also being very specific with each example that I employ through the different elements. So for me, speculative fiction is very malleable. It's like a Play-Doh or a clay that I can make anything out of. This is my first time I had to do like real research, actually, and there was a lot of it. I'll be thinking about, okay, I'm in this scene where it's, um, they're at the chow hall. And I'm like, huh, I wonder what food is like in prison. I'll get an account from somewhere and I'll do my little research and it'll be like, surprise, surprise, it's horrific. And there's all these reports of food poisonings and it's way atypical considering like the general population, how many foodborne illnesses exist in prisons. And then, so that's like an interesting fact. And so sometimes that will appear somehow. I'll realize, okay, this character has a parent who's been incarcerated was kind of the literature about that. And so basically it would often be, I would get situated with a subject and I was like, I think this, there's depth here that I am ignorant of and try to search for it. And so I would actually just like almost one-to-one -one be like, oh, we have this term rubber bullets, what's the deal with that? And then I'll do some research and be like, that's actually a huge euphemism. Rubber is not even a primary component in rubber bullets. And, and then maybe there'll be some, that will somehow appear in the narrative. But more likely is I would just read a bunch of this sort of like ideas about the sort of almost spirit of not only abolition, but also incarceration, those who are pro incarceration and just let it kind of sit in my body and then write knowing how those things are moving through me. I kind of wrote this book hoping I was gonna be abolitionist because I think abolition had kind of become into the popular, had kind of come into the popular zeitgeist in a way that not was shallow, but felt uh, somewhat uninformed. I think that sometimes people hear things and they say, I agree, but then if you ask them about it, by like, oh, no, 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 no. I, I think I went into this book hoping I was an abolitionist and through this research and through these ideas and holding them in my spirit, I was writing from a place of 
discovery, but also finding out that I actually truly was an abolitionist. That is, I do not believe that prison should exist as it does exist in any, in any way. That's like the real form of the research to me, was just becoming informed so that I could write the story. And it wasn't even research per se sometimes, sometimes it's meeting people. I, I did work with a group called the Rockland Coalition to end the new Jim Crow, I still work with them. And you meet the incarcerated, people who are, um, have been exposed to the injustice of the carcer in the incarceration system and and their humanity sort of reminds me better than anything I could read in any book that the system we have now is evil. I try to work from the idea that every person is valuable inherently. Every person desires good for themselves and the people they love and let that be evidenced through their decisions even if they are what we might think of as terrible. And so when I do that, I also know that I have characters who are often in very difficult situations in terms of like the systems that are oppressing them. And so I try to create those like that, that or protect that essential humanity that is getting a lot of pressure on it. Cause that's what's happening to all of us all the time. And I think that makes people more empathetic. It's not something I naturally like really actually think about. I, I just try to make the character capable and react in ways that feel realistic to their situation. But I think they come off as empathetic sometimes because um, we get the sense that they are humans trying their best, even if they're often failing. I think part of my purpose as a writer is to help make compassion the standard. I hope I could be a small drop in that bucket that's pushing us towards rethinking our communities, societies, civilization at large, and try to make love and compassion the standard. I think that fiction is very good at doing that because in the practice of doing it and in taking it in, it requires you to be imaginative. It requires you to stretch this muscle, if you want to call it that, that creates something, creates that which is not already there. And so to, to create that world that I'm talking about, which doesn't exist and maybe hasn't exactly existed ever, you have to go into this space of imagination. And so for me, fiction is really powerful for that reason. It gets us to in that practice of doing that. It makes us say, oh, wait, I've never seen this thing. It doesn't exist anywhere, but I see it clear, clearly in my mind's eye. And if you can see it in your mind's eye, then you know maybe you could bring it to reality. So that's just one of many reasons. I think fiction is an inherently empathetic gesture while you're allowing someone to, I mean, I can say that for all reading, allowing someone to you know, engage at your sort of brain space, which is normally just for you, but I'm really interested in that imagination part and getting people to practice the magic of imagining radically that which does not exist at all. I, I kind of think, and maybe this would be true of every book, but I kind of feel that Chang Yang All Stars is like the accumulation of my entire creative and personal life. I think it's like sort of, it's kind of come to this point where it feels very aligned in I would use the language purpose. I know some people don't think about that that way, but it feels very aligned and sort of a personal and creative purpose for me. And so it's, I think the idea, almost every story I've written in some ways is, surf, is servicing this, almost every sort of place I've gone to school, so many of the people I've met, I think a lot of who I am generally is represented in this book. I think that hope is a discipline and a practice. I think that it'd be a very like privileged take to be like, well, I guess we lost. I don't believe in that. Also, I'm a very like stubborn, competitive person. That's just not my vibe to be like, it's over, we lost. If Angela Davis is working and still doing the stuff, then I, who am I to be like, it's hopeless. You know, people who have like had their bodies threatened, have seen people killed, they're fighting right now still. And so I can take leadership from that. But also I think that in just my personal experiences with people, I see that, I think what I'm actually like hoping to arrive at is not like some 
I think it's really where we are, where we want to be, like naturally, but we have all these systems that we've been, that we've put in place that make it difficult. And so it, 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 it's not that unnatural. Abolition isn't just about removing things. It's actually about adding institutions. It's about adding, you know, compassion. So we know where that most quote unquote crime is the product of poverty. How can we interrogate that with the full heart of our resources? Um, we know that so many people that are incarcerated suffer from mental health issues. How can we be compassionate about that in our communities and in our institutions? Um, we know about the lack of access to education or proper education. How can we be compassionate about adding that? How can we end food insecurity? How can we end housing insecurity? Those things. Adding those things is really what abolition is more about than removing prisons. And those things benefit all of us. I think compassion is our actual real starting place, but we, we're made to feel as though we're competing for resources or spaces to live or, or that because of race or gender or this or that, like we're in this like competition for with each other. And I think when we can remember that so much of that's an illusion, the person in the worst prison and you are both people, um, I think a lot can change.